Bruchem Aboyim, again, thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. So, part of the first part of the lecture, the topic of this week's My Thoughts, uh, is about buying a lottery ticket. Well, I'm certain that someone may find it a bit unusual that I would promote buying a lottery ticket. So, so let me begin with a story told about the Holy Baal Shem Tov, again, the founder of Hasidus. The story begins shortly after the Shabbat ended. The Holy Baal Shem Tov, with a group of his faithful Hasidim, again his followers, boarded a wagon and went on one of his legendary journeys after the Shabbat. As they began their trip, they could hear the sound of the hoofbeats of the horses against the cobblestone street. And then, almost as if in an instant, they realized they had traveled a great distance and they were now miraculously in a strange place. Now, the horses came to halt in front of an inn located in a small village. They looked up and they saw a humble Jew who had come out to greet them. He told them he was thrilled to see them, since it was not common for him to be visited by Jewish guests at his inn. He was so excited about being allowed to fulfill the great mitzvah of Hachnosis Orchim, of attending to wayfarers. The innkeeper graciously invited the Holy Baal Shem Tov and his Hasidim into his inn. And once they were all seated, the Holy Baal Shem Tov asked the innkeeper for a glass of tea with some milk for himself and for all of his followers. The innkeeper was only too happy to comply. Their host engaged them in conversation and he asked them uh, where they were from. They told them they were from Mizabuz. Hearing their reply, they asked them if they knew of the great Sadiq, the Holy Baal Shem Tov. And before anyone else could answer the host, the Holy Baal Shem Tov himself asked not to be bothered with so many questions. Instead, he requested accommodations where he and his Hasidim could sleep for the night. Well, in the end, that night turned down to a five-day, five-night stay, during which time they literally ate the host out of house and home. When they finally left, there was not so much as a crumb that remained for the innkeeper's wife and children. Nonetheless, both the host and his wife were ecstatic that they were able to fulfill the great mitzvah of Haknosah Zarkham, of hospitality. As the Holy Baal Shemta was leaving, the innkeeper accompanied him to his wagon. He asked that they should mention him to the Holy Baal Shemta so that he could receive a blessing. He requested that he should be blessed to be able to be a good, and God-fearing Jew. The Holy Baal Shem Tov smiled and told his host, I am the man that you are seeking. He continued, and in time you will come to understand why it is that we came. As you can imagine, the host was stunned with the Holy Baal Shem Tov's revelation. But, but before he could recover his senses, the Holy Baal Shem Tov and his Hasidim were gone. When he returned to his inn, he was greeted with the sounds of his children crying, and they were all hungry. The problem was that his guest had eaten up all the food in the house. The couple had even sold off anything of any value that they owned so as to satisfy the needs and requests of their holy guests. But now, now the cupboards were completely bare. Hearing the cries of his children, the innkeeper lifted his eyes up to heaven and he prayed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Master of the universe, why must my children suffer hang hunger? How are they guilty for my sins? Suddenly he realized that someone was knocking at his door. And when he opened the door, he saw that standing there was Ivan, an elderly Jew, pardon me, Gentile, who, who again, who was standing there. Ivan would occasionally come to his inn for a shot of whiskey. But before the innkeeper could tell Ivan that he had nothing to offer him, Ivan said that he had come to ask him a favor. He told the innkeeper that at the present he was living with his married daughter and her abusive husband. They were not very hospitable towards him and he was far from being happy. He asked the innkeeper if he could possibly come live with him and his family. Now before the innkeeper could even ask, answer the question, Ivan explained that he really needed very little. He added, that he was more than able to pay for his room and board. Money wasn't a problem, he said, since he was in possession of a great fortune. 
He told the innkeeper that after his death, this entire fortune would belong to him. With that, Ivan told the innkeeper to bring a shovel, and he, and <clears throat> he followed Ivan into the forest. Once they were in the forest, Ivan showed him where to dig under a certain tree, and there he soon discovered numerous bags of gold coins. Ivan told him to take one bag from now, and that would certainly cover all the expenses for quite a while. And now from that day on, the inn was filled with everything they needed and more. What a sense of joy and relief it was to the Jewish innkeeper and his family. Now, Ivan lived for only a few more weeks, and then he died suddenly. After Ivan was buried, the innkeeper dug up all the bags of gold coins that were hidden beneath the tree. It was a fortune. He was no longer poor. He was now a very rich and influential man. After he put all of his affairs in order, he decided that it was now time for him to visit the Holy Baal Shem Tov, and so he traveled to Mizabuz. When he entered the study hall of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, he was greeted warmly by the Holy Tzaddik. The Holy Baal Shem Tov inquired about the man's family and financial situation. Now, the Hasidim were a, a bit surprised by all the attention that the Holy Baal Shem Tov paid to this wealthy stranger. So he turned to his students and asked them, don't you recognize this man? After all, you spent five days in his house when you ate him out of house and home. Now I can reveal to all of you, and to him as well, what was this, what was this all about? You see, God Almighty had decreed in heaven that this man deserved to become wealthy. However, he was content with his lot in life, and though he was poor, he never asked for any more. So there was a fear in heaven that he would remain poor forever. But when we spent those five days in his inn, we devoured all the food that he had in his house. We left him with virtually nothing. There wasn't even a crumb left for his young children to eat. Then, because of the cries of his children, he was compelled to cry out to God. It was only then that all the blessings that were waiting for him materialized. That was when God Almighty sent Ivan the Gentile neighbor with his treasure. It was so that this innkeeper could continue to fill the mitzvah of Haknasa Zorkin, of taking in guests in a state of wealth and prosperity. So too in our lives, we need to create a relationship with God our Father in heaven. We recite in the Amida, the standing prayer, at least three times daily. Again, the formula that the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the men of the Great Assembly, instituted for the Amida prayer, which is the same for every Amida that we pray, 365 days of the year. In the first three prayers, we praise God, and in the last three prayers, we offer thanks to Him for all of our many blessings. The middle 13 blessings that we recite on weekdays are all requests. Then on the Shabbat and the holidays, the middle prayer is not a request, rather it connects to the theme of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I find interesting is that we are not permitted to insert any personal requests in these last three prayers of gratitude. Yet, if we look closely at these prayers, two of them are actually requests, both for the rebuilding of the temple and for the return of the sacrifices. And then in the last of these three prayers, it begins with the request, Sim Shalom, a prayer for peace, goodness, blessing, life, the list goes on. So how can it be stated that we make no personal request in the last three prayers? You know, our relationship with God, our Father in heaven, is different from any other relationship that we share with any other person. If another person has helped you many times in the past, especially financially, the greatest news that you can tell them is that you appreciate all that they have done for you in the past. But you want them to know that you now have the ability to stand on your own two feet and that you will no longer be needing any further assistance from him. You are happy and so is your generous patron. However, when we thank God Almighty for his benevolence towards us, the words that we express are, are completely different. When we thank God for all of his goodness that he's, and blessing that he's bestowed upon us in the past, we do so by saying thank you 
for all that he have done for me in the past, and that now I realize just how much more that I still need you in the future. That is how we acknowledge God's benevolence, with a request for even more assistance. You know, there's a story told of a, a poor man who had been blessed by a great tzaddik. The tzaddik told him that he should buy a lottery ticket and that he would win. So he bought the ticket and waited for the winning number to be drawn. But in the meantime, Chaim, the thief in Dvinsk, heard that this poor man had bought a lottery ticket and that he had done so based on the blessing of the tzaddik. So Chaim decided that he should steal the poor man's ticket and take it for his own. Uh, but he didn't want the poor man to realize that he had stolen his lottery ticket. So what he did was he replaced the poor man's ticket with a ticket which he had purchased himself. When the winning lottery number was drawn, huh, it turned out that Chaim the thief's original ticket, the one that he had substituted for the ticket that he had stolen from the poor man, was the winning ticket. Now, as you can imagine, Chaim was quite upset. After all, it was his ticket that actually won the lottery, not the ticket that he had stolen from the poor man. So Chaim the thief decided to take the poor man to court, <laughs> hoping to retrieve the money that he felt was rightfully his. The case was brought before the Av Bezdin, the head of the rabbinical court in Devinsk, <clears throat> the, the Or Sameach, Rabbi Meir Simcha of Devinsk. Now the thief admitted to the Rav that he had stolen the poor man's ticket and replaced it with his own. That was the ticket which turned out to be the winning number. Now, even though he had stolen the poor man's ticket, he contended that the winning ticket still belonged to him. He felt that though he was a thief, still he should be awarded all the money. So the Orson may have decided in favor of the poor man. He told the thief that it may be true that the ticket that won was his. However, in heaven, it was not the ticket that was chosen as the winner. It was the person. So it made little difference which ticket the poor man held. Either way, he would have won. The money belonged to the poor man. We need to know with complete certainty that God Almighty has set aside a certain bounty for each and every one of us. All we need to do is ask. You know, a while ago, a friend of mine called me and said that he had lost $40,000 in the stock market. I told him it was impossible. He told me that before he had 40000 in his portfolio, and now it was $40,000 less. I repeated myself, you couldn't have lost the money. So he asked me, how did I figure that he didn't lose the money? So I said to him, listen to what you said. You said you lost the money. I said to him, if the money was yours, then you couldn't have lost it. Every Rosh Hashanah, every New Year, Jewish New Year, God Almighty decides just how much money each one of us will receive in the following year. If we lose money, it wasn't meant to be ours in the first place. This is much like a business. Most of the monies that are collected in a retail business go towards operating expenses. We as businessmen do not lament the fact that millions of dollars pass through our hands. What we are concerned about is the bottom line, the profit that we earn. Based on this fact, one has to realize that just because money passes through your hands doesn't necessarily mean that it's yours to keep. So getting back to the title of my thought, so why buy a lottery ticket? The odds are astronomical, one in 300 million. We have a precept in Judaism called Makshava Kamasa, that a thought is considered like a deed. This means that if you had an intention to do a good deed and for some reason beyond your control, you could not fulfill the act. For example, if you were unavoidably detained, uh, if someone else got there before you, or the necessity no longer exists, or any other reason. But if you truly wanted to act on your thought, it was not just rhetoric. Our sages tell us that God will consider your thought as a deed, and you will be rewarded. So if you buy a lottery ticket and you say to God that if you win, you will donate a certain amount to charity, even if you don't win, you win. Since your thought was to donate a portion of your winnings, you get that reward even though you didn't win. 
I do buy one lottery ticket every time that I go to the gas station. So I say to God that I will donate half of my winnings to charity. So if I win even $2, I donate $1 to charity to fulfill my vow and to show that my commitment was genuine. So if you buy a lottery ticket, in reality, you can't lose. If you actually possess a winning ticket, well, then great, you've received money. But even if you don't win the money, if you have committed to donate from your winnings to charity, you still win a reward from heaven. You can't lose. In addition, you have created a vessel into which God your Father can place great blessings if he so desires and if you ask him properly. You know, it happened once at a public address given by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a blessed memory, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson. He presented an opportunity for a packed crowd of Lubavitcher Hasidim and others that were in attendance. It seemed to be a very auspicious time for blessings, since the Rebbe said to all of those who were present, whoever is ready to undertake the test of great wealth, let them raise their hand now. It happened that only three men raised their hand in response to the Rebbe's amazing offer. Well, the Rebbe then bemoaned the fact that only three people had raised their hands. The Rebbe went on to say that every week I receive hundreds of letters from Hasidim telling me of their dire financial situation. And now, when wealth is offered, somehow all the Hasidim become extremely pious. And they refuse the gift of wealth. Well, those three individuals who did raise their hands all became multimillionaires. And so in life, there is a Yiddish saying that says, Chaparayim, quickly take advantage of the situation. You know, many times in life we only get one chance to achieve success. As an old medieval saying stated, that opportunity only knocks once. But I believe that if you learn something from your error, it's not necessarily a failure. It may serve as a stepping stone that will elevate you so that the next time that opportunity knocks, you will be prepared to open the door of an even greater success. You know, sometimes I think that you might want to look at giving charity as an investment banker. You want a big client to invest his immense wealth in your bank. So in order to enhance the chances of you securing his account, you want to assure him that investing with you will give him the greatest return for his money. So too, in our relationship with God Almighty, if we want him to invest his money in our account, it might be wise for us to show him that we share our wealth and prosperity by taking care of the needs of the elderly, the sick, and the poor that exist in the world. There's a great logic to what I've said. You see, when the poor and in indigent observe that no one cares about them, that there is no one around to offer any assistance, well, they cry out to their Father in Heaven. They ask Him, why is he such a cruel and heartless parent? However, when we care for the needs of the less fortunate in the world, then they praise God, their Father in heaven, for sending his angels of mercy to help them in their hour of need. So buy a lottery ticket. Have a conversation with God. Just the fact that you bring him into the equation is already a giant step forward. Thinking of helping others with some of your winnings creates positive and righteous thoughts, which also adds to your merits. Sure, you'll think about your yacht, your mansion on the ocean, and of course your private jet. But nonetheless, you have entertained charitable thoughts that bring you closer to God Almighty, your Father in Heaven. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sukkana quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for attending and listening. Again, God should bless you with health, and safety, and, and uh, success. Buy a lottery ticket. You never know. You may win. But either way, you can't lose. God bless. Shabbat Shalom.